Hello and welcome everybody to another session of the Growth Clinic. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, very excited today. Uh, we got a really great session. Um, uh, just briefly, uh, if you haven't uh, joined before, the Growth Clinic is a community event we put on every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, all about solving your toughest uh, growth and digital marketing challenges. And uh, I am joined today by uh, two lovely uh, folks. Um, our uh, wonderful CEO and co-founder, Chris Mechanic, is with us as always, along with uh, our head of paid social, uh, Danny Lopez, who uh, um, is uh, kind of a legend when it comes to Facebook ads. He's been doing Facebook ads since it was a thing. What's going What's on, Jaylon? Hey, how's it going? Thanks for joining right Pretty on Pretty good, time. man. Pretty good. Yep. Good. Yep. We're just diving in. Um, we're going to be talking all about Facebook ads today and kind of the state of the union in 2022. Um, yeah, and Danny, have you, Jaylon, have you met Danny before? Have you guys uh, ever connected? I don't think so. Yeah. Good to meet you. Good so, to meet you as well. Uh, Jaylon's with uh, Everfy, um, one of our awesome clients. And uh, Danny is our head of paid social here at Web Mechanics. And uh, uh, he's been doing Facebook ads since it was a thing. So he's the perfect guy <laughs> to bring on and uh, ask about um, everything that's going on with Facebook ads these days. Um, uh, to kick us off, Danny, uh, I'm curious if you could kind of give us um, sort of a brief chronology, because you've seen all the big changes with Facebook. Um, maybe take us through the two, two or three big things that have happened in the last 10 years with Facebook and uh, where we are today. Yeah, I'd say a lot of the biggest things have definitely happened in the, the second half of, uh, you know, the past 10 years or so. Uh, really, it's, it's, but the biggest thing, in my opinion, is, is just being able to leverage the algorithm, right, and being able to find your ideal candidate uh, in this broad pool of people, you know, that was something that you weren't able to do, you know, 10 years ago, uh, you know, Facebook's definitely taken huge strides in that department. Um, I'd say the next thing is post-back conversions. Our CAPI uh, conversions API is about five different names uh, that you can call it. It's, it's definitely a big one. And uh, it, it's had a, it's had a really big impact on a lot of my campaigns because you you're not just optimizing for you know whatever that front end metric is um, you know i.e. a lead uh, but you can actually optimize towards some type of you know revenue goal or some type of you know lower funnel business outcome uh, those two things are probably the the biggest um, are probably the biggest uh, things I've seen come 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 down the pipe. Uh, as it relates to Facebook, uh, obviously there was a bunch of stuff that happened last year, you know, post 15.5 uh, that, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about later. And you know, one of the more recent things um, that has had an impact, not, not a huge impact like the other two is um, it's about, I want to say about two years ago, uh, Facebook dropping the 20% tax rule has definitely had a huge impact on, um, on a lot of the way we look at creative uh, and how we how we put certain ads out there and the messaging behind them because we can have much more text heavy ads now versus you know ads that were a lot more like either you know photo centric or are you know heavily relied on illustrations. Yeah, wow. and I think zooming out, one of the real game changers that took place with Facebook was of course Cambridge Analytica, right? Like mm -hmm. the so when that happened, all of the eyes turned to Facebook, all the reg regulators and legislators became super duper interested in Facebook, started breathing down their necks, and then they in turn started breathing down the advertisers' necks. So ad approvals have gotten much more difficult. Um, things like account bans uh, take place frequently. Mm -hmm. And there's just limited audiences, right? Like you used to be able to on Facebook pre Cambridge Analytica target like in a b2b setting people that worked at certain companies mm -hmm. right but that's like i think i don't know if they if they still have job title targeting anymore we still have job title targeting but there was actually a, i want to say about three weeks ago uh facebook just did another round of updates where they removed um uh quite a few detailed interest groups um that again we no longer have access to and if Anyone is unfamiliar with um, the whole Cambridge Cambridge Analytica scandal. There was a great documentary that came out in 2000, 2019 called "The Great Hack" on Netflix. Definitely check that out. Um, but yeah, ever since ever since that whole scandal, uh, you know, targeting has definitely become you know more and more limited. Where if we do need to get some more of that granular targeting, uh, you know, one of the things that we can still do is 
you know, rely on things like third party lists, which we have seen some success with recently. Yeah. And I think that could be a big part of the reason why the algorithm, why Facebook's algorithm has advanced so rapidly, because it's almost like, hey, we can no longer target these these little audience pockets. So, you know, let's use technology basically to allow the more advanced advertisers to continue doing yeah. that. Which is good and bad if you don't know what you're doing, because it's very easy to optimize for the wrong thing and you'll get a super, super cheap cost per lead. But, you know, if, if, if you're not knowing, you know, how to train the algorithm within this broad pool of people, uh, you could really be shooting yourself in the foot. Yep, makes a lot of sense. And um, I know one of the big things that changed, um, Danny, you alluded to it in 2021, um, I'm sure is on a lot of people's minds is this whole iOS 14 mm -hmm. uh, debacle. So um, maybe take us briefly through what happened and, um, you know, how that impact, you know, our, you know, Facebook ad accounts on the ground level, and what are some practical things we can do to adapt going forward? Yeah, so Apple introduced something, uh, or actually, they, they pushed us on, on a lot of advertisers called app tracking transparency, which uh, it's something you'll see now, uh, you, you wouldn't have seen it prior to 14.5. Um, but if you open up an app, it has to ask you to allow uh, tracking and you have to opt in. Uh, and they push this on, Apple pushed this on uh, all app, including apps, including Facebook, Instagram, uh, yeah, TikTok. So this isn't just something that uh, uh, impacts, you know, Facebook, it impacts uh, all apps um, that are, uh, that rely on, uh, on, on iOS 14.5 and greater. But the, the, one of the big things that, um, you know, really came out of that was the attribution delay where you know, it, it can take up to 72 hours now to record a conversion. So if you have, if you have things like automated rules that are running in real time that, uh, you know, might you know, pause a particular ad or ad set or campaign uh, based on that day's performance, you might have to reevaluate that because of this delay now. Uh, the other thing is the attribution window shrunk post 14.5, it used to be 28 days, now it's seven days. And that's concerning for you know, companies, uh, particularly like e-com companies where the decision-making process might be a little bit longer, right? So we have you know, one client now that uh, specializes in you know, very expensive gold jewelry where someone might not see an ad and make a purchase that day or even that week. You know, it, could take, um, it can take several weeks. Uh, I can take uh, multiple touch points, whether that be on Facebook or their email campaign for them to finally you know, make a purchase. And if they made a purchase uh, that happened uh, you know, post seven day click, then that's not going to record in Facebook. So you're kind of trying to piece together everything that's happening in either Google Analytics or their shopping cart and having to tie that back to you know, what you're seeing on the front end of Facebook. And it's, it's been quite a challenge. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and then, you know, definitely sounds like a challenge, but fortunately it sounds like, you know, there are some things we can do to at least uh, rework our workflows so that um, we can take these, you know, iOS 14 changes into consideration, um, you know, and solve for the data loss. Um, I guess the shift is some, some things that are within our control. Um, I know one of the big things that still drives results um, on Facebook today is creative. Right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, obviously the right creative can make or break a campaign, especially with the way, you know, platforms like Facebook work. So talk to us about that. Um, what's working today in terms of creative, what are some tactics and examples of uh, creative approaches you see working right now on the platform? Well, I was talking about it earlier. Um, um, once Facebook got rid of the 20% rule, but, uh, I would say ads that really focus in on, you know, text. Uh, so, you know, we were calling it here at Web Mechanics text heavy ads, uh, so ads that, again, focus on text and have a really clear, concise message and get to the point and say, this is what we do, not, uh, you know, not something, um, you know, that's that that's vague, but, you know, just ads and messaging um, that are, you know, clear, concise, bold and get straight to the point. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. Chris, um, I know you have some thoughts on creative. Anything you're seeing in the wild that, you know, particularly stands out to you or you see working? So creative is always going to be, I think, 
the number one make or break factor of, of any campaign, Facebook or not. Uh, there, so the way to think about it on Facebook, I think, is you have to stop the scroll. You're competing with cute babies and cats and birthdays and weddings and things. You, it has to have stopping power. So whatever that ad is, uh, needs to have stopping power. Some element of movement, some element of animation. You could use emojis. You could use um, basically like uh, like Danny was saying with the directness. You know, the the direct lead into offer uh, is is a way, especially on the bottom of the funnel that you can you know just pull those that are ready to buy out. Uh, there's different formats that we're liking these days. Like you can run video survey ads uh, where you, and actually use the survey itself, which is only, it's a, it's a, um, you know, only two answers that you're allowed to do, but you can use the survey itself to segment, qualify, build audiences for retargeting. Um, so I'm always really curious anytime there's a new format or something new, generally introduced to a platform i'm always curious to go and learn about it because a lot of times there's arbitrage opportunities um like messenger ads i think are also good and one of our core philosophies is what we call ioqs or indicators of quality so a lot of times on the post click experiences on the landing pages and the funnels we're gonna keep them interactive and almost conversational to generate useful data signals so an example is like in the solar space, we have a client in the solar space. You can only, they can only sell to somebody if it's a homeowner, obviously, right? They, if you're renting, they can't sell. So we took their typical funnel, but we incorporated an IOQ, an indicator of quality, which was basically just a pre-page, like a step before the actual landing page. That was simply, hey, do you have, or are you a homeowner? Yes or no. Mm -hmm. So that's a, the two things in any, any ad campaigns, any platforms, any time I think moving forward, the two keys to it are going to be creative and data. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things we've seen work well um, is disqualification language on the ad itself, right? So to Chris's point, like we've, we've tested ads where are you a homeowner? Like are for homeowners only? Uh, another example is, um, uh, you know, do you have good credit? Do you have more than this amount in debt? If so, this product is for you. Um, and we've seen a lot of success with that as well. Yeah, we're also seeing a lot of success with dynamic creative ads. Mm -hmm. So dynamic creative is basically where you can upload 10 different images or 10 different versions of a headline, 10 different versions of a tech of the text, and basically allow for Facebook to mix and match. That can work really, really well. Like if you sell a product or a service where there's multiple different benefits or there's multiple different like personas that you're targeting, uh, or even if you have different offers, uh, the the idea and what's working, especially on Facebook, is to have the targeting be somewhat broad, uh, de develop creative that uh, that hits on these different benefits or assuages these different objections, jam them all into a dynamic creative ad, and basically just like let the algo figure it out. Yeah, and I would say this year we've really seen an increase in performance with dynamic ads. Yeah, last year, I don't know if it was just us, uh, the accounts that uh, we manage, but we didn't see a ton of success last year with dynamic creative. And it just seems like this year, uh, I don't know what happened. Um, it's, it's, we've, we've seen a, a huge uptick in performance. So, uh, and a lot of the new tests we're publishing now are focused around dynamic creative. And again, we're seeing a lot of success. Interesting. Yeah, that's really cool. Danny, I want to circle back on something you mentioned brought up earlier, which is the conversion API. Um, you know, obviously, one of the big things that allows us as advertisers to do is selectively post back events mm -hmm. uh, to Facebook, um, both pre and post conversion. So I'm curious, what are some um, practical ways um, you know, advertisers can take advantage of that or things they can do to start using the conversion API in their accounts? Yeah. Now, one thing to keep in mind, again, post iOS 14.5 is that the attribution window is now seven days. Right, so a, a client has to, or an advertiser has to think about, you know, how long the sales process is and where is that, um, when in the sales funnel is it the correct time to post data back into the platform? Um, let's take something like a mortgage, for example, right? A mortgage can take, you know, 30, 45, sometimes even 60 days to close, 
right? You don't want to have that endpoint uh, or an actual funding of the mortgage be the thing that you're optimizing for or that signal that you're passing back to Facebook because the attribution window has now closed. You, you want to look um, you know, farther up funnel, right? So did, um, did a loan officer uh, you know, talk to someone and then they express interest within like the first 48 hours of a lead submission. That's a great point right there to, uh, or, 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 uh, that's a great indicator of quality to pass back to Facebook so that Facebook could potentially optimize for that. Yeah. So if your sales cycle is longer than seven days or longer than 30 days, really, because most platforms look back uh, 30 days by default, then you need to find a signal, something that takes place during that sale, which is indicative of quality, and use that little signal to ping back, mm. right? So for instance, in, in Danny's mortgage example, what happens when somebody, when you get a phone call from a prospect and the salesperson is talking to them and they're qualified, what physically happens at, right at that moment where it's like, boom, this is qualified. What happens in CRM? What is said on the phone? What, what are those signals that we could potentially grab and pipe back to the platform within a seven day period or within a 30 day period on, on the other platforms? And another thing to keep in mind is you also want enough data coming in, right? So if, if you don't have a lot of phone calls or a lot of those connections happening, then it, th this might not be the best thing for you. You know, Facebook does like 50 conversions per week per ad set. You know, that isn't always the case. Like we've had campaigns run uh, successfully and have been able to learn where we've been able to make it work with less than 50. But just as a general rule of thumb, we want at least 50 of those, uh, you know, per week for Facebook to really do its thing. Uh, you know, so that's also something to take into consideration. If you're only getting five of those a week, uh, you know, hypothetically, then that it might not be the best thing for you. Now, Danny, I have a kind of a weird question for you, but with the look back window on Facebook now being seven days, that means if a conversion takes place on day eight, we won't see it in platform. But the Facebook pixel is installed on the website, mm -hmm. so they have access to the data theoretically. Does the algorithm still know? Like, in other words, if we said, okay, we don't worry about what the reporting says you know, but we still want to register this conversion and we still want to model the audiences based off of that. Like, like, in other words, is the algo smart enough, you think, to still sense it and understand it and learn from it? Yeah, or the, does the, the actual data flow just cut off from Facebook? Yeah, the, the pixel, it'll still register on a pixel, but in terms of like reporting on anything in platform, you won't get that data point. Mm -hmm. unfortunately you know but Imagine. there are other things that we can do right so like let's say the conversion api just won't work for you because you, you know your 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 sales process is too long you don't have enough of those uh you know post conversion touch points happening there are other things that we can do uh, specifically on the form and chris this is something you and i have uh, spent a lot of time talking about, you know, there, there are certain ways we can fire the conversion pixel that indicates uh, a higher likelihood for that person to close, right? So there's very specific questions we can ask. Like, let's go back to our, our, uh, our, our mortgage example. And I know, you know, mortgage example right now with rates being what they are might not be the best example, but uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and stick with it. So um, I have a form and I'm trying to collect leads for my mortgage company. But there are you know, specific things that I look for um, that uh, I know if a person answers these correctly, you know, they might turn into that transfer or they might turn into a funded loan. Uh, one of those questions might be you know, credit score. Um, do you have above you know, 620? If you have that, yes, I'm going, to, I'm going to take that into consideration when I'm firing a pixel. Another thing might be a loan to value ratio. Right. Do you have at least 50% equity in your home? If so, that's another indicator that if that is true, I want to fire a conversion event. Uh, another thing could be income, right? Do you, how much do you make? Do you make you know, more than you know, $50,000, $60,000 a year? 
if that's true, then yes, I, I want to use that as something that, uh, you know, I'm optimizing for, and I, I want to build that into my conversion objective. So if all those things are true when they submit the form, that's when you can fire your conversion event. Um, and uh, you, we've seen a lot of success with that um, in multiple different industries. Uh, so that is, again, one workaround. If you can't, uh, you, you either can't get the conversions API to work for, you know, dev reasons, or you just don't have enough data coming in. Gotcha. Interesting. Um, so we've talked about what to do once we're um, converting users and kind of how to engage them with creative. Um, let's, I, we've touched a little bit on this, but let's talk about targeting our audiences on Facebook. How has that changed in the last five years? And um, you know, how should we be approaching targeting now in 2022? Yeah, so you know, we talked about Cambridge Analytica and how since 2019, we've lost a lot of our detailed targeting options. Again, it, it, it really, you know, we really rely on training the algorithm, specifically using that example I said before, like you just don't want to fire conversion for every single lead. You want to fire conversion for someone who's, you know, very qualified so that Facebook can pick up on these signals and you can go into a broad audience and Facebook will know exactly who to target uh, based on the data points that they have internally. You know, we've also seen some, when we do need to get, you know, very granular, we've also seen some success with, uh, you know, third-party lists as well. Gotcha. Third-party lists? Yeah. Uh, so there there are different, uh, you know, data providers that you can work with um, that will, you know, sometimes rent you a list. Uh, and they have different models on what they charge. Uh, but again, we've seen success with that. We're also... Uh, it, we still see success with some of our um, yeah, interest targeting and some of our lookalikes, but not like we don't see the same level of success that we see with, with some of our broad targeting. But again, in order to make our broad targeting work, you have to you know, be sending Facebook the right signals so that they know exactly who to target within this broad pool of people. Gotcha. Yeah. So targeting strategies generally are leaning toward broad on the Facebook side of things. Uh, if you have your data set up where your pixels are firing selectively and based on the factors that actually correlate together to create a sale, um, you're definitely way ahead of the game. But sometimes Facebook will get a little bit lazy. So what happens algorithmically, Danny explained to me, is basically when you say, okay, broad audience targeting, here's my data signals, go find them for me, Facebook. Facebook will go and identify like a pocket of that audience and generally play within that pocket, right? They're like, okay, cool. Now we're going to hang out within this pocket. And you know, that's the case because you find uh, frequency going up, you find percent of first time impressions going down in a lot of cases. So I like to use a concept called the broadest relevant audiences. So you're still selecting some, you know, some settings, but you're going with the broadest relevant audience. So you're looking for audiences of like at least a million uh, people in most cases. So you could have your broad campaign and that will work, but a lot of times there's some burnout. You need to, you know, continually rotate in new creative, but I like to force Facebook to not be lazy by rolling out other fairly broad campaigns, but that have a little bit of targeting and kind of just force Facebook to look like, instead of just looking and playing within this little pocket of audience, like let's look over here, Facebook, come on, stop being so lazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've done that within, uh, you know, CBO campaigns where we'll have a, a, a campaign with, with different audiences where, you know, one might be broad and one might be that more uh, you know, refined list that Chris is talking about. And, um, you know, eventually phase out the more fine list as the broad, uh, you know, learns and matures. Uh, then we specifically do that with, with newer accounts, though. So, Danny, real quick, sorry to put you on the spot here, um, but real quick, and then we can finish up or, or bust out into questions. But ABO versus CBO versus manual, like what's the difference in a nutshell? When do you use each? Do you love either of those options? Do you hate them? What, how, how do you approach that topic? Yeah, so recently we've seen more success with CBO than ABO. With ABO, you definitely have more control because budgets are controlled in the ad set level versus the campaign level. Uh, usually when I am running ABOs now, um, it's within you know clearly defined retargeting campaigns where uh, 
Um, you know, I, I'm working with smaller audiences. I need to be very careful about how I'm deploying budget within those ad sets to make sure that, you know, I'm not burning any one of them out. Uh, usually now that's that's how I, I, I run my ABO campaigns. But for the most part, everything I run has been CBO. Um, and we've tested that pretty pretty extensively um, with, with, with a good amount of budget. Um, and and just seems like what CBO. is CBO versus ABO exactly? Yeah. So CBO is, is when you let Facebook uh, decide where to deploy budget on the ad set level. So you're setting your budget on the campaign and then uh, it, depending on, you know, what's performing, you know, well that day, Facebook might decide to give, you know, hundred dollars to that ad set or $200 to that ad set. It's, it's all dynamic. It can, and it really depends on how performance is that day. So, and CBO stands for campaign, campaign budget campaign optimizer. Optimization. So ABO is ad set budget, budget. optimization. Mm -hmm. And that's where it will just spend according to whatever budget you set at the ad set level. Correct. Is there a third option or is, is everything either CBO it's or ABO? It's either CBO or ABO. Okay. So ABO seems to make sense. Like if you have different segments of audience that you absolutely must or want to serve to, right? Like different cohorts, for instance, like you've got industry A, industry B, industry C, for instance, and you want to make sure that each of them gets a certain amount of spend behind them, then ABO is the way. CBO is the way where you're just like, hey, Facebook, like basically here's the budget here, the ad sets, spend it however you can uh, most, most efficiently. Yeah, and, and we'll also, if we want to test audiences uh, and give every audience, uh, you know, an uh, equal amount of budget, then we'll use ABO there. Uh, and whatever, whatever wins, we might pull out and put that into a CBO. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, th that's, that's the only other time I use ABO. It's so funny because with all these platforms, all the moves that they make are going more toward just leave it broad and let us figure it out, right? Like Facebook's like dynamic creative, just upload a whole bunch of stuff. Like we'll figure it out. And they're like CBO, like it's going to perform better. Just put all your ad sets in there and let us figure it out. So if you're running CBO, CBOs only with all DCAs, all dynamic creative. You're basically like, here's my money, Facebook, go do what you want with it. And that's where the importance of the data signals and the data piping come in, because that's the accountability that you can use to make sure that Facebook is indeed managing your money well. Nice. Just got a couple more questions and let's move into some Q and A. Um, so I know that a, a lot of folks um, considering Facebook ads, um, you know, are in environments that are particularly challenging um, for targeting. Um, a couple that come to mind, Danny, I'm wondering if you could speak on is um, highly regulated industries. So particularly those that um, are restricted in terms of housing, employment and credit uh, regulations in terms of who they can target. Um, I'm also curious about B2B because I know there are a lot of B2B advertisers who want to use Facebook but aren't really quite sure how to crack the code on the platform. So um, I was curious if you could speak to, you know, highly regulated industries and how to leverage Facebook in those and, and also B2B as well. Yeah, so let's start with uh, housing, employment, credit, or, um, or we call it HEC. So that's a that's a pretty broad spectrum, right? So it, uh, housing, employment, and credit. So that's anything involving you know real estate, uh, anything involving any any advertiser who lends money. So a mortgage company, a credit card company, personal loan company, uh, and employment. So any 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 company that is looking to hire someone. Um, and it's particularly challenging. And Facebook, uh, uh, it was Q3 of 2019, put out uh, new rules as it relates to marketing in these industries. So we can't target by gender, we can't target by age, we can't target by zip code, um, which is a good thing um, because it prevents discrimination uh, in the ad platform, right? But um, let's take, a, let's use a debt settlement example. So in order to qualify for debt settlement, you typically have to have more than $10,000 in debt, right? If I'm 18 years old, I probably don't have $10,000 in credit card debt because I just had access to credit. Uh, you know, so we can do things there like optimize for uh, you know, a higher self-reported debt amount on the form, right? And then what you'll see is when you look at your uh, ad spend breakdown, you'll see it start leaning towards an older demographic because those people have had more time to accrue credit card debt. 
Um, so it, it goes back to the point up uh, the point I made earlier about you know knowing what questions to ask your ideal candidate, right? Like what what are the things that they have in common, or what are the things that will indicate um, you know the highest likelihood of a sale? You know, figure out a way to ask those in the form. You know, fire your conversion pixels on those things, um, and you should be okay. Gotcha. It makes a lot of sense. And how about for B2B advertisers? Anything they can do? Yeah, uh, B2B can be, uh, you know, very challenging, uh, especially because we did lose a lot of targeting. Uh, we do have a B2B campaign that we're running right now on Facebook that does rely on the third party list that I was talking about. Now, again, a lot of those third party lists do come with some type of fee, right? Because you're basically renting someone else's data. Um, but you can use those third party lists to basically give you a head start to you know, refine, uh, refine your campaigns. And then once you have enough data and, uh, and, and the account or on the pixel, uh, you, you, know, you can start to loosen things up a bit. Yeah, there's also Clearbit. So Clearbit is a tool that allows you to essentially create audiences on Facebook, similar to the way that you would on LinkedIn. Uh, several of our clients use it. It does work in a lot of cases, but a lot of times the a lot of times it doesn't perform as well as LinkedIn, even if it is the exact same audience. Um, the third party list that Danny was uh, referencing, there's a lot of different ways or a lot of different places that you can get those from. Those tend to, I think, do a little bit better um, sometimes than Clearbit. But there's this outfit called Deep Sync Labs, uh, which we like as a place to license the third party data sets. And think of those just like audiences, basically, and you can activate them from right within your account and you pay a CPM rider. So you might pay like an, an extra dollar or dollar fifty cents or whatever it is on a CPM basis, in addition to whatever you're already paying out to Facebook. Uh, so they can very much uh, make sense in that regards. B2B is really it's tricky on Facebook. Like sometimes it can work, sometimes it can work well, but in some spaces, like no matter what you do, it, it just won't work at the bottom of the funnel. Like if you are selling a very complex enterprise level system and the buying cycle is, you know, by committee and is 12 month sales cycle and $2 million average deal size, you're not going to be able to just spin up a bottom of funnel campaign on Facebook and expect to get a whole bunch of leads. However, for any B2B, really regardless, even if you are that enterprise software uh, client, there, you can definitely do some work on the top and mid funnel for Facebook. So you can, you can take your best content assets or your best offers for the top and mid funnel, run those on Facebook to build audiences and, and get those people basically into your halo. So we call those qualified uh, identified audiences. And that's where if you're a B2B, like that will be an effective technique on Facebook pretty much every time. If you're, if you're focused on top and mid funnel, then you're going to actually close the deal, so to speak, via your website, via email, via LinkedIn. But you get, you get those kind of early stage buyers into your audience halos uh, in that way. Yeah, and to your point, Chris, it depends on you know what type of B two B campaign we're running. Like, are we looking to to get those you know enterprise deals that have the twelve month you know sales process? Are we are we just looking to target small business owners? Right, those are right. two completely different types of campaigns. If right. we're just trying to target small business owners, then yes, there is there there are more levers we can pull uh, within Facebook versus you know those enterprise level clients. Awesome. One last question, then let's break into some Q&A. This is a two-parter. Uh, first part is, uh, are there any new um, features or opportunities in Facebook ads that have cropped up in the last year or so that um, advertisers may not know about or um, should start taking advantage of? And the final part is, where do you see Facebook going in the next three to five years? What's coming down the pipe? Yeah, uh, the thing I'm most excited about is the Reels placement. Uh, so that's... Uh, that's uh, definitely blowing up right now. And, you know, they, they, Facebook saw everything, all the success that was happening with TikTok and is, is trying to duplicate it. But uh, we're seeing low CPMs there uh, and we're seeing high engagement. Uh, so definitely check out the, real play, the Reels placement. There's also, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about them just yet, but there are some closed betas um, that, that Facebook is 
uh, currently uh, working on right now, which should be available, I believe Q3 of this year, uh, which basically allows you to optimize for two different conversion objectives. I uh, can't share too much up more than that, but I'm really excited for that one. Cool. And anything else coming down the pike in the next three to five years for Facebook ads, or what do you think? Yeah, um, get more post conversion data and uh, more user generated content is is really where I'm seeing um, uh, yeah, Facebook going the next few years. Awesome, Chris. What do you think? You know, I think that it's going to well where Facebook is going. I think is in a similar trajectory to where it is now, where it's more and more so saying hey, give us, you know, give us the latitude and we'll get you the conversions. It's also becoming more and more competitive. I think Facebook will begin monetizing harder. They'll probably start monetizing some of their other assets or you'll, you'll continue to see new ad formats. Like, I don't know if you guys ever use Messenger, but Messenger ads uh, or Messen like Facebook Messenger is a placement option. I've personally never seen an ad on it, you know, so they're just not monetizing it hard. But especially now with their stock uh, going down, like they're going to continue to be thinking about that. Uh, and, and I imagine creating new assets, new content assets. And frankly, I mean, look, they changed their name to Meta, right? So there's clearly going to be a Metaverse play and that doesn't exist yet. So I think that getting in uh, early in some of these new placements or whatever Facebook is doing that's new and novel they're going to start running ads on there soon. And so like zooming into those types of placements, like Danny said, with reels, you can get really cheap CPMs early on. Nice. Very cool. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Um, let's break it down in the Q and a. So, um, yeah, EJ Jalon, um, any questions on Facebook ads or, um, you know, any, uh, things you're noticing or interested in learning more about? Uh, I think, unfortunately, I won't be super helpful for this convo. Um, okay. We're not yet doing paid over here at Beehive, so I've been away from media buying now for a few months, but um, always love to keep a pulse on, on what's going on for when we, we pick it up. Dude, EJ, you know what you might do? Have you heard uh, Dennis use media inception strategy with a dollar a day? Uh, no, I'm not familiar. So he'll he'll basically... Uh, spend a dollar or spend a very small amount of money each day mm -hmm. running ads essentially to influencers. So think like, you know, the journalists at the publications that you would like to get written up on, for instance, mm -hmm. think like almost like a PR play, yep. uh, which makes a lot of sense. It doesn't cost a whole lot, but it could very well because because journalists are basically constantly looking for content. Like they're always on the hunt for a good story that their audience is going to like. Mm -hmm. So if you could put that good story out there and just literally pepper that audience, because it'll be a, a fairly static audience, like people that work at Forbes or whatever, mm -hmm. um, where, and, and you're just like basically constantly peppering them, like sort of in the background a little bit, looks kind of native, like doesn't really look like an ad. And they're like, Ooh, cool, cool story idea. Yep. So that's, I don't know why yeah. that just came to mind randomly. Yeah. And that, that actually brings up a, thanks mama. Um, it brings up a strategy that I never actually had a chance to implement, but um, was always very interested in trying. And I, I may actually roll this out um, in the future here at Beehive. But one of the things that um, I've always found really compelling is, you know, with e -com, you know, the, the automated um, like catalog type ads tend to work really, really well. If you have like a platform and you have, you know, lots of different products and those are all powered by a, a feed and you can create that feed, you know, dynamically or you can create it statically. And one, um, I guess, concept, I've never seen it necessarily implemented, but I thought it would probably work really, really well is to either create or structure your content on your site so that the signals that the pixel is collecting um, can then be either fed into a dynamic feed or you can you can structure it for a feed um, and then use that catalog of content as a catalog ad to drive very cheap engagement clicks. So what this would look like is you have you know 100 posts on your blog, you pull out metadata, title, description, um, you know, image URL for the featured image, 
um, and you format that in a way that when you upload it to Facebook, Facebook can parse the image to the image of the uh, tile, the title to the title of each tile, and then the description to the descri description of each tile. And then basically run that with a simple engagement like click through type conversion. And what will happen is that Facebook will test all of those cards uh, and will basically spit back out, um, you know, a dynamic, you know, dynamically optimized feed of content that users are clicking through. And obviously, if you're measuring downstream conversions, you can see, you know, which pieces of content would be driving you know, clicks that lead to, you know, on-site engagement or, you know, a sign up or whatever. Um, but I've always been very curious to test this, you know, with, in a situation where if you have, you know, a couple hundred pieces of content, loading it up and letting Facebook get you those super, super cheap engagement clicks and telling you basically how you can, you know, which ones respond, you know, the best and um, using it as a way to just drive, you know, relatively qualified traffic. Cause this would of course be your website content. So, um, you know, web mechanics, you have so much content there. Imagine just pushing that out to the, you know, to the world, uh, you know, consumers, regular everyday people aren't going to be clicking on the, you know, updates that Google has been making to their, you know, algorithm, but somebody who is a marketer might click through that. And so, um, you know, just a different way that instead of just creating a, a static ad, cause you can make an ad out of that page, you know, normally, but you have no idea like whether what, which one of your hundreds of, of pages is going to be compelling in that way. Yeah. Um, so you could do a thing with that EJ. I like that idea because it's, it's almost like dynamic search ads on search Yeah. where you can be like, Hey Google, I got a million pages on my website. These 500 of them are eligible. Yep. Like look at these 500 URLs basically. And you pick the keyword, like you pick the targeting, you pick the keywords it's really useful on search because you can get a lot of good keyword data, you know, like yeah. you'll find keywords that you would have never thought of, but I like it on social too, actually, especially if you're choose like if you can say not the whole run of site, but instead like take these hundred, like highly complex, highly technical, highly, uh, you know, basically the ones that only your audience would ever think to click on or engage with, you know, like the geekiest of the geeky stuff or like the, the things that, are polarizing to the effect that like only a buyer would like it or the that ones that are really driving signups already. Like you have, you have content that just like already does perform well organically in terms of, you know, say there's like a sign up or something on it. You know, I've, I've clicked through Jared's emails and read some of your blog posts and I know that they all have ways to collect info. So you could say, you could filter by like, all right, which are the top 20, top 50, top hundred posts that are driving qualified leads, you know, and inbound, um, and do it that way. Just, you're absolutely right. Just to add on. That's to cool. A That's bit. a good idea. So unfortunately, I never able to get, I was never able to implement it. There was a, a company that was interested in, uh, well, it was, uh, yeah, I think it was, I was just throwing around ideas with uh, Trading Sim, actually. They had, I just had seen something around uh, trading and I, I reached out to one of those guys and was like, hey, I just had this idea. You guys should should try it out. But I don't think they had the, the um, they just didn't have the time to do it. But But I feel like when you're, when you're using ad formats for a purpose other than what it's intended for, you're probably onto something, you know, like you're probably going to strike gold somewhere along there. It's kind of like hacky a little bit, but like using dynamic product ads actually for content feed, like that would be definitely an example. We have app install clients where we'll sometimes run like, and there's an app install objective where almost all of our campaigns run there, but we've tested things like running video poll ads and just, you know, mm -hmm. simply for the URL, you just point it to the app store the way that you are, but it's like a click campaign with a, with a video survey type of uh, engagement. But I love using, I love using ad formats in unconventional ways, you know? Yep. I mean, that's usually where the, the arbitrage is, you know, for value because it yeah. hasn't been played out yet. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. I like cool. it. What's on your mind, Jaylon? You guys, go ahead. Yes. Um, I mean, I can attest to everything that uh, you guys have said as far as like the broadness of Facebook. Um, I, I worked with Facebook really, really closely, like weekly um, for the past year and just seeing like the trajectory of the company change within that time frame is pretty uh, astonishing. Um, uh, 
as far as like the broad targeting, that is something they they're definitely pushing because they push that on us and we kind of face the same issue that um, well, we're all facing is hey, just put in all of this stuff into this bucket and we'll decide where it goes. But you as the advertiser, you kind of, you want that control over your assets. Um, but it's really where I guess the trajectory of paid media is going or programmatic advertising in general. Um, they're simplifying a lot of the platforms, I guess, to help like the small business owner that doesn't really understand um, like the back end, uh, I kind of like to give the analogy that giving like Google ads or Facebook ads to someone who's never done it before is just like giving them a Lamborghini and saying, go, um, it can go really good or it can go really bad. And it'll probably go really bad if you don't know um, what you're doing. You can spend a lot of money quick. So, yeah, I, I definitely agree. Um, I feel like one of the interesting things is, is seeing how they want you to emphasize more creative and um, less on the implementation, but more so the long-term strategy. Um, I know for the, the Facebook algorithm, I think the formula is um, expected bid, um, creative engagement, equals uh, estimated customer value or something like that. Um, but it's it's a formula that they use that they actually dictate to show what ad to what person. Um, and that's why they don't base the bids off of who has the highest bid is more so who has the most engaging content um, as far as creative. Yeah, that's I agree with that 100 percent because we, you know we've see we've also seen lower CPMs with ads that have higher engagement, right? So we almost get rewarded for that for for having creative just really works well and resonates with people, right? Because Facebook's goal is to keep people on the platform and keep mm -hmm. them clicking ads, right? So if you know your ad isn't very engaging and they're scrolling past and they're getting bored, then you know that's one less click that they could potentially earn, you know, and potentially more longer term. So um, you know, it's, it's almost like quality score on Google search, right? You know, it's the same sort of concept stuff where they want to solve for the objective of their platform, um, which in Google's case is delivering the right result. In Facebook's case, it's, you know, retention for as long as possible. <laughs> um, so um, it makes sense that you know, we would be rewarded for engagement on the platform. Definitely, definitely. I'm, I'm pretty excited to see how they um, delve into uh, web point three. So the metaverse, I know that's really, really big. So I don't know as far as like time frame, but I'm pretty sure they have a, they're working up some kind of elaborate plan to monetize that because they're really at the forefront of it, to be honest. hundred percent. Yeah. I think the first renditions of, of the metaverse, like of web three for Facebook will probably come in the form of augmented reality. So imagine that like Facebook invent or Facebook comes out with a new app, which is like a camera app almost, right? And they've got these like little goggles you could wear and you're walking around New York City and your view is appended with all types of things. I've actually thought about that. Like how cool would it be if, you, if you've ever been to a new city? Like, don't you sometimes wish you just had like a tour guide walking around with you? Like you see like a cool building and it's like, I wonder what the heck that thing is. So I think that's the first rendition that it'll take, like some kind of a hard, some kind of a hardware device that you carry around with you as you walk around to augment your reality, right? With, with different data or with different information. With, so like you look at the Domino's pizza and it'll be like, oh, you know, current wait time is 16 minutes kind of a thing, you know? Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, that's, the augmented reality, NFTs and blockchain. Um, I feel like the next five years is going to be pretty crazy, pretty interesting. Buckle up. It's yeah. going to be a ride, baby. Buckle it up. Definitely. Definitely. I won't have to flip oh, a God. coin to know whether I got to go to Gino's or Pat's for my Philly cheesesteak. <laughs> I'm, I'd be really excited to see that, to see the, the virtual tour guide thing. Like I would spend a lot more time walking around a lot more random cities if that thing existed right now. 
Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for joining. This was fun. It was a really good conversation. Um, you know, if uh, you're watching on the YouTubes, um, feel free to drop us a like, a comment, a share. Uh, we do these every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, hope to see you here. Um, we'll be doing covering new topics every week. Come get your questions answered and come learn cool new stuff. Um, Roll masters. up. Growth Clinic, baby. Let's go. All right. All right. Love it. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next time. Great to Thanks, see you guys. Guys. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.